Hello, ladies. Welcome to our webinar on women and investment management. Um, I will be your speaker. Deepa and I will be your speakers for today. My name is Warisha Mahmoud. I'm an investment consultant at Century Financial. Hi, everyone. Uh, so uh, I am Deepa Sachanandani. I'm a chartered financial analyst and uh, I work with Century as a senior research analyst. So uh, we are really excited to have you all. And um, let's just get the session rolling. All right. So, yeah, we are super excited for you all to be a part of this really special Women's Day event. So let's just jump right in. Uh, before we get into the whole good investment stuff and all the good stuff about investing, I just want to cover quickly as to why women are known to be better investors. So here are some key statistics we have about female investors. So contrary to popular belief, female investors actually earn better results than male investors, up to 1% even. And this is not just a one-off case. It's actually been a study and research that's been conducted over the years. And it's constantly been proven that women and female investors in general are smarter, more rational investors and attain higher returns than male investors. Um, and even as for last year, female investors outperformed male investors by 0.3%. And it's actually not, it, it seems like a small number, but it's not when you compare it over a larger portfolio, which is pretty um, impressive. And um, although we do have a lack of females within the investment field, but as of Japan, for example, 25% of retail forex traders were women, um, are still women. And um, yeah, it's just something that's been evolving. And now more than ever, women are getting more and more entrepreneurial. They're getting more uh, financially independent. They want to learn about investments and actually be on top of things, which is honestly amazing. It's, it's an amazing thing as women we are experiencing. And speaking of which, we can go over some inspirational women of our time. For example, we have, of course, there are so many inspirational women, it was very difficult to um, categorize them down. But we have some amazing ones, such as Kathy Wood, who is the CEO of Art Investment Management, which is like an asset management company. And they have these art innovation ETFs, and they've even won awards for their ETFs, which is super impressive. Um, we even have Huda Patan, for all you ladies who are into makeup and cosmetics, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of Hoda Beauty. So Hoda Kutan is actually the founder of Hoda Beauty, which is not just popular within the Middle East, but even internationally, like the UK, US, etc. Um, we have Whitney Wolf, who is the founder and CEO of Bumble, which is a social networking dating app, which actually recently had an IPO. And Whitney actually did the IPO whilst holding her baby, which was super impactful and gave a really good, strong message that we as women can even have a family, a baby, et cetera, and still have the ability to run a firm and carry out an IPO and have a career, et cetera. Last but not least, Indra Nui. Uh, she's been the chief executive officer at PepsiCo. Of course, we know PepsiCo is a large firm with um, a very large market cap of about $182 billion. Um, and it's, it's really nice to see women in these leadership top positions. Um, now, getting into why, what really makes women better investors, like what is it that women have that makes them get the edge of being a better investor? So first things first, women are known to be risk averse. So women tend to take lesser risk compared to men, like it's more like a lower risk and a lower return and a stable and very um, rational way of investing, which is Good, it's sort of like in our DNA. So that's, it's, it's very impressive that we have that. So risk averse investors usually tend to have lower, more stable um, profits and they, they are hurt less in times of market volatility. Women also do not hesitate to accept assistance. So they don't have any ego or anything to actually seek out, ask for help or assistance from their consultant or their um, advisor just to get get a view on the market as in you know what to invest in how to invest in learning the keys uh, the key trades of investing women do not shy away from asking for help which actually benefits them in the long run and it's pretty impressive um 
Women also work with caution and uh, they do not tend to overpower their emotions. So it's, it's actually very advantageous when it comes to investing. Um, just having your emotions under control is super important. It's, I cannot stress that enough. Just having emotions under control is super important. And um, they even have less attachment. So we have a phrase that we use on the trading floor, which um, says never marry a stock. So there are times where, you know, the markets could be volatile or your favorite stock could be declining and you're like losing on some money. But I think women have the ability to realize when to let go of that time and actually, um, you know, accept that and move on to recover the funds from some other stocks, for example. However, men tend to be very attached to stocks and they're just like, it will go up, it will go up. And it's just, um, you know, it, and it just harms them in the long run. Um, and honestly, there have been some studies which have shown that women actually trade lesser than men, which is, um, you know, it, it, it sounds like, you know, why, why is it better that women trade less than men? But it's good in a way because you're being more patient. With investing, you have to be really patient. You have to be calm, have a, a sane mind, and just be very rational when it comes to investing. So they tend to trade less. And there was a study which was conducted which showed that women traders actually logged in less onto their app, their trading app, to check their portfolio compared to male investors. Male investors do this more frequently. Um, and it, it's good in a way that, you know, they trade less, they're more patient and more cautious when it comes to um, investing. So all in all, just to sum it up, women are known to be rational. We have this in our DNA, we're known to be rational thinkers, um, very well organized when it comes to managing money and investing, et cetera. And um, we should take that to our advantage. Now I'll hand it over to Deepa to get into the good investing stuff and more details about investing. Hi, thanks, Varisha. So uh, yeah, like Varisha exactly said, women have been, you know, dominating the um, financial world as well, as well as in terms of businesses and investments, we have women uh, taking over, uh, you know, even their male counterparts. So uh, the idea of today's session is basically uh, to see how we can empower our investments and let money do the work for us. So we need money to do the work for us and make us more money. So the idea of today's session is to concentrate on how we can, uh, you know, deploy our funds into wise investments. So, um, yeah, so what exactly are, uh, is investment as we're all aware investment is nothing but you know in the acquisition of an asset or an item uh, with the primary goal of ensuring that it's generating income or appreciation so just say for example uh, we invest in real estate the idea and intention is that you uh, generate a regular rental income or, or you're looking for property appreciation as well in the long run so um so there are different categories of uh, asset classes just like you know we have a wardrobes and we have different categories be it an ethnic wear cultural wear uh, formal wear likewise there are different categories of assets and it's always wise to have your funds invested in a basket of securities so uh, we will be categ we will be uh, discussing about each of them in detail um, but just to give you a broad classification uh, generally assets can be categorized as either uh, risk free assets or risky assets um, now fixed income and cash for example are considered you know uh, risk free assets or less risky assets whereas the ones on the right be it equities commodities real estate forex are generally considered to be a little more risky asset. Now, uh, so we'll just talk about each of them in detail. Um, when we come to fixed assets and, okay, sorry, one second. Yeah, when when we come to uh, fixed income and cash, so uh, what what is fixed income? It's basically one of the oldest forms of investments which are considered less risky and out here, you primarily earn a fixed income, a fixed interest on your investments, and hence they're called as fixed income assets. 
So um, there are different and various examples. The most common one that I think most of you all could relate with uh, are recurring and uh, fixed deposits that we have. Now, the problem with fixed assets and fixed income investments is that uh, the, the income that you generate or the percentage that you uh, attain on such investments is very low. It's like in the range of two to three percent. And probably that's not even sufficient uh, in today's time to you know, fight inflation and uh, to meet all our uh, life standards. So you need to ensure that your investments are in uh, other assets, which probably give you a higher return. So coming back to fixed income, just talking about uh, other fixed investment assets. Uh, so uh, classic examples could be government bonds and treasuries. Now, uh, just to give you a brief about what are government bonds. So uh, whenever the government is in need of uh, money, they would uh, reach out to the investors and the public in general and issue corporate bonds uh, in return for providing a fixed uh, principle, I mean, in the future and a fixed interest rate. So what you get in this is a guarantee that you'll be receiving all your money at the end. And despite that, you'll also be achieving a certain amount of fixed uh, interest rate year on year. So, uh, of course, if a United States government is issuing a bond, you know uh, they're never going to default on your payments and they are uh, definitely risk free assets. And hence, because the risk is less, you end up earning lower returns. You have other categories as well, that is municipal bonds. These are bonds issued by the state, uh, respective state governments, and they're slightly more riskier than the government bonds. And then we have corporate bonds, which are bonds issued by corporates itself. So say, for example, if you have big companies like Apple and uh, Microsoft uh, in need of cash and they are issuing bonds, uh, you would feel relatively secure to invest in such companies given their uh, strong historical uh, profile and the fact that these companies ha have been doing really well and are big brand names out there. So this was fixed income. Now the idea is we cannot have uh, all our investments in fixed income, like I said, because it doesn't suffice for meeting the inflation. And hence we need to consider other investments as well. So. Uh, coming to uh, equities now equities can be categorized out here into three categories we have stocks or shares then we have index funds and exchange traded funds so when i talk about stocks now uh, what exactly are stocks these are like um, when a company is in need of finance they would be uh, you know issuing shares and that is basically nothing but a partial ownership that you achieve in a company when you purchase the stocks of a particular company. So, um, you know, the idea of stocks is that if you believe in a particular if in a particular company and in a particular product, then why not actually invest in that company as well and own uh, some amount of uh, uh, some proportion of that company? So uh, we just have a small quiz and uh, uh, poll out here for you all. Uh, for example, how many of you have, um, you know, a membership in uh, Netflix or or any of your family member has a Netflix subscription? Could you? OK, so I can see that people over here have already answered and it's like 100 percent. So each and every household and all of you all over here has a Netflix subscription. So wouldn't it be wise to invest in a stock like Netflix? Because this company has given almost 450% returns in the past five years. So say if you would have invested a mere $10,000 in Netflix five years prior, today you would have $45,000 in your account. So Netflix has done, uh, you know, your money has grown for you just by investing in Netflix. So why not invest in stocks and let these stocks do the work for you? Let me ask you another question. Like, do you or, uh, you know, own an in, own or intend to own an Apple product? OK, so that's already there. Our poll answers are here. Again, we have 100 percent of the people saying that they do uh, own one or intend to own one. So Apple in the last five years has given 1900 percent returns. So if you are particularly investing in a product of the company and if you believe in that company, then why not actually own the company? If you would have invested just $10,000 in Apple five years back today, you would have 100 and that would have grown to 190K. So that's a big amount. Why not, you know, park some of our investments in stocks? 
because stocks generally in the long run they end up being profitable but depending if the business is sound and you invest wisely so um so just to give you another example we had a stock like gamestop now um this company basically used to sell uh, you know video games and now the future has totally changed and we are into um, games like pubg and you know pokemon and live games like that so the demand for that stock has has totally gone and that's why that stock has totally crashed so uh, you need to invest wisely you need to focus on the businesses that have the potential to grow in future and uh, that's where we and our consultants come in and uh, help you guide on to what kind of investments we can make talk about netflix how many of you all actually have a netflix account and again our pause is there already and we have 100% so uh, if you if all of us are actually using net uh, facebook google on a day to day basis why not invest in these companies at least some proportion and let them uh, do the work for you let that let your money grow out there so that's about equities now uh, coming on to uh, index funds now if you want to if you want to invest in a particular if you want to invest uh, say in in uh alphabet apple uh tesla netflix all together how do we do that okay there are certain indices which track particular companies so for example you have the nyse fang plus now this index tracks uh the movement of 10 particular stocks like apple you have google you have amazon you have tesla netflix so all of these companies can be invested by just one button you just need to buy the fang index and you will have you will have you will be invested in all of these stocks likewise you have spx 500 now spx 500 is again a popular index in the united states which tracks 500 companies then we have nasdaq 100 now nasdaq basically tra tracks the technology companies in the united states so if you believe that tech is the future and you don't know which particular stock to invest in just buying nasdaq index would meet all your requirements and there is there it is you are invested in uh, technology stocks so if you believe in particular investments then uh, then it's important that we you know invest some proportion of our funds into these uh, companies again we have exchange traded funds as well um, just to explain it in a layman term it's nothing but uh, again an exchange traded fund is tracking the same performance of uh, a particular index or a commodity or likewise so uh, the first one that we see over here on our screen is um, spdr s&p 500 etf now this uh, etf basically tracks the performance of spx 500 so uh, on one hand say if uh, spx 500 is trading near 3500 dollars and uh, you know if you do not want to invest that kind of investments uh, in that kind of cash in spx 500 you can look for an uh, spdr uh, s&p etf because that is trading at around 400 dollars and it will give you the same movement and the same performance of spx 500 so um, there are different investment opportunities available out there moving on to our next section we have commodities so um like you invest like we invest in uh, equities there are different commodities out there the most common one being uh, gold as we are all aware uh, so gold is considered as a safe haven asset like all our mothers uh, and you know parents say that always ensure that there's a certain percentage invested in gold to help you fight out you know the crisis or any uh, situation in life so gold is considered as a safe haven asset that whenever there are any war or a crisis like situation generally you will see gold prices move up so last year when you know the pandemic uh, struck and uh, there was a huge disaster on the stock market as well uh, at that point in time um, gold prices started uh, moving up and in fact last year gold uh, rallied by almost 25% so gold is generally considered as a safe haven asset when all your other uh, when equities and other assets are not doing well you can generally see that gold prices tend to move up 
Then we have others like uh, silver also, which comes under the precious metal. We have industrial metals. We have energy, for example, crude oil, gasoline, natural gas. Now, uh, last year, um, again, because of the pandemic uh, in March, uh, April, when there was a lockdown, uh, there were no flights, people were not traveling. So obviously the demand for crude oil and gasoline and products like these crashed miserably. And uh, all of these uh, prices, literally uh, crude oil even went into negative territory for a minute, for some time. But then it was a no brainer out there that eventually the demand for these products will uh, recover and will rise. And we had many uh, clients, you know, who actually bought the dip uh, in these products. And had you done during, uh, had you bought, uh, so for example, crude oil during the dip, uh, you would have made returns of almost 200% as of today's day. Prices, uh, so for example, if I take the average price during March, April, the, the average was around $20 and today uh, Brent WTI are trading above $70. So that's almost more than a 200% jump. And uh, yeah, so there are always opportunities available uh, in the market and we just need to capture the uh, right um, opportunities. Now, even when it comes to agricultural products that are different, uh, if people are in, interested in trading agricultural commodities, then there are many available uh, on our platform. Now, one particular trend that we observe generally in commodities are uh, seasonal behavior. So uh, generally, for depending upon the demand, supply, weather conditions, you'll see certain uh, commodities tend to do well during a certain time period. So, for example, uh, the demand for, uh, you know, oranges generally shoots up in the month of November and you will always see uh, more or less on an average that prices rally in the month of November. So that is an amazing trading opportunity uh, that you can, you know, uh, take in that particular month. Like uh, we had uh, given out these trades to our clients and the ones who took the trade uh, made 12 percent profits within one month itself if you uh, bought the commodity. So, uh, for example, uh, the next one that we have is sugar raw. So there's a tendency for uh, sugar prices to fall in the month of March and April and then pick up in the month of June and September. So uh, like you see this year, uh, prices have already started falling in the month of March. So uh, we have these historical analysis, like if you're taking a bet on the markets, uh, this is more of a speculative bet and the chances of it going right are higher because uh, you know, out of the last 10 times, eight times it has gone in a particular direction. So, and another example that we have over here are gasoline prices. Now, ahead of the winter season in, uh, I mean, ahead of uh, once the winter is um, coming to an end and people can get out on the roads and take their cars, gasoline prices generally shoot up in the United States. And like we can see, in the past 15 years, the month of March has always been positive for gasoline, barring the exception of the year 2020. So in 2020, uh, like I said, we had lockdowns and uh, prices just crashed across the board. So gasoline did suffer a major loss. But if you held on to your investments, then you recovered, in fact, gained more in the months following April and May. So. Um, we need to invest wisely and ensure that a proper risk management practices are in place while uh, we take any of these trades. Now, moving forward, we have real estate and Forex. Uh, as we are all aware, real estate investments are mainly uh, investing into a property, but investments in property require a huge amount of uh, cash, down payment, and if you don't have so, you can still participate in the real estate markets by investing in something called as REITs. So uh, REITs are, if I were to just give you an explanation about REITs, um, so say, for example, uh, there, is, there is an institution that is pooling money from 100 people and uh, they will collect that money and then invest in a particular property. So instead of one person investing in a property, you have 100 people pooling their funds together and then investing uh, into uh, into a property and then whatever rental income uh, or appreciation uh, is derived from that property that will accordingly proportionately be distributed among those hundred investors. So that is how a REIT operates. We have many REIT stocks available um, uh, on the platform and in the markets. Uh, so again, a great opportunity to capture the real estate market if you do not want to personally invest um, in the property market as well. 
Apart from that, we have Forex trading, and that is nothing but um, for that's like the exchange of conversion of one currency into another. And uh, let me tell you the size of uh, the daily trading volume on the Forex platform. Uh, internationally is almost five trillion dollars on a daily basis in fact it's even more than that um, so talking about different currencies we have dollar index which tracks basically six currencies then we have euro usd gbp usd if you are bullish on any of these currencies if you feel next year the euro is going to go stronger then you can easily uh, buy uh, the uh, euro usd pair so that's how um, we have different currency assets I mean, and overall um, different assets that we covered so far. Now, the next question and the important question is that having seen so many uh, asset classes, how do we understand uh, where to allocate our funds or how do we allocate our funds and in what proportion do we allocate our funds? So uh, should we invest everything into bonds or should we invest everything into equities? How do we diversify? Now, the answer to that is, uh, firstly, it's very important you diversify your investments. You need to ensure that you're investing across uh, different asset classes because that will help you avoid major losses. So when whenever there's a major fall in the markets, like last year, for example, uh, stocks prices and everything crashed. Uh, at that point in time, initially, even gold prices fell. But later on, gold recovered uh, and it actually outperformed the market for uh, some time. So when you have invested in multiple asset classes, uh, your ability to weather the downturn becomes uh, much better and your losses are comparatively lower rather than concentrating all your investments in a particular stock or in a particular asset class. So it's always so yeah, it's always best that we diversify our uh, investments. Uh, moving forward, uh, let's look at um, the um, so what what is an important factor that needs to be considered in how do we allocate our assets? So uh, two key factors that need to go into consideration is your time horizon and your risk appetite. So and one of the major factors that decide and look into both of these factors is an individual's age. So let me give you an example. If you are in your uh, 70s and, uh, you know, you're already retired at that point in time, uh, it would not be wise to invest all your investments in, say, the stock market, uh, which, for example, if it crashed miserably like last year, uh, you would have had a major, uh, you know, heart attack. And plus you would have even lost all your life savings. So at that age and when you know that you don't have other sources of income and have already retired, it wouldn't be wise to invest all your money into uh, the stock market or other risky asset classes. It's wise at that point in time to diversify and to ensure that you have more percentage concentrated into bonds and other fixed assets which are giving you a regular stream of income and your capital is protected. But on the other hand, if you are an individual in your 20s and say if that person would have invested everything into bonds, then he or she would have missed out the massive 2500% rally in SPX equities over the last 40 years. So obviously it has to be a balanced approach uh, and the idea is the younger you are, the more you can concentrate on risky assets and the older you get, you uh, gradually diversify into uh, the safer and the risk free assets. So the basic rule and the old rule uh, used to be 100 minus your age, just to make it easy and clear for you to understand what um, it used to be uh, just for simplicity, we've considered only two asset classes, that is stocks and bonds. Okay. So 100 minus your age uh, should be your investment into stocks and the remaining should be into bonds. So, um, or if I were to say the other way around, 100 minus your age should be into risky assets and the remaining in uh, less risky assets. So uh, the problem of late right now, this was the old formula. The problem is that life expense expectancy has gone up uh, and has risen uh, steadily across developed countries. Um, so you need to ensure that your money is doing the work for you for more number, more number of years and you have enough finances to survive throughout, uh, you know, your old age. So for that case, it's important that you have major percentage of your investments into stocks, which can give you a higher return. 
So the new rule and the new funder has been uh, 110 or even 120 minus your age. Is That is what is a, a proportion and the percentage that you invest in uh, stocks. So say if, for example, you are a, a, a aggressive risk profile and you don't mind taking risk and you're happy and comfortable with taking some amount of risk. So in that case, you can go forward with the 120 minus your age. So if you are in your 30s, uh, you know, you can probably invest 90% uh, in stock markets and the remaining 10% in uh, bonds. Uh, so I am the aggressive risk profile types. Uh, in my 20s, I had almost 100% invested in uh, equities. And trust me, it has uh, helped me to a great extent. Um, but on the other hand, if you are a little more conservative and a more moderate risk profile uh, and don't want to see your portfolio or, uh, you know, your hard earned money going through any kind of losses, uh, then you can uh, probably choose for the conservative risk profile, wherein uh, in your 30s, you have 70 percent invested into risk assets and the remaining 30 percent into bonds or other risk free assets. So that's how the asset uh, allocation uh, works. Now, um, now that we've seen how asset allocation works, it's important to know uh, where to invest going forward and uh, what are the investment opportunities that uh, do exist in this in the coming year and uh, in the years ahead. So before we do that, just a quick recap of how uh, major uh, stocks and uh, assets performed last year. So like you can see, uh, I already mentioned previously as well, uh, gold was one of uh, the top performers, but even silver had amazing returns. So the thing in green, light green over here is how much the, the, the instrument or the asset uh, gave uh, the returns on an annual basis. Whereas if it's in light blue, that means that was the loss for that particular year. So as mentioned, crude oil and energy uh, commodities definitely had a bad year and they suffered losses of almost 20 percent. But if you invested in the markets when you're in the dip, then uh, crude oil products give you a return of almost 180 percent. Stocks uh, and uh, other assets also eventually they bounced back quickly from the lows and ended up the year 15 percent higher despite it being uh, you know, a situation wherein people actually thought that the world is coming to an end and, uh, you know, there was no way going forward at that point in time. But uh, investors literally uh, pounced on this opportunity because the government was funding an ample amount of stimulus and liquidity into the markets. And that is what drove all the stock prices higher. And obviously now the rollout of vaccines is uh, supporting the case further. Now, within the asset classes, like within that particular index, what were the sectors that did well? So uh, undoubtedly, technology uh, was the winner last year. And for obvious reasons, we were shopping online, we were binging uh, online, we were working from home, using Zoom communications even right now. So uh, obviously, technology stocks did uh, lead the way. You even had uh, material stocks, uh, in fact, uh, people use the opportunity uh, to move out into remote locations or to buy new homes and uh, the demand for material uh, stocks also shot up last year. And obviously, um, healthcare was uh, the strong performer last year for obvious reasons. Once that didn't do well, again, energy is out here. Uh, it really had a bad year. And uh, we also had financial stocks, which uh, didn't do well. Financial stocks, by financial stocks, I mean banking companies. And that was primarily because interest rates dropped uh, drastically last year. And banks earn a major proportion of their income through uh, the interest that they charge on the loans. So because of that, uh, even uh, banking and financial stocks had to take the hit. Now, in terms of currencies, uh, dollar uh, was uh, the weaker currency last year. It actually suffered losses of 7%. And uh, the primary reason behind that was the ample supply of dollars in the market. Now, United States has, has pumped in trillions and trillions of dollars into the economy. And when the demand, I mean, when the supply is so high, it's obvious that uh, the prices will uh, fall or slide. So uh, that was about 2020. So moving forward, so what's going to be the key theme for 2021? 
Two key things that I can think of. One is the stimulus impact. Like I just said, the governments and central banks across the world are pumping ample amount of money into the markets. And that is providing a lot of liquidity and cash with the investors, which is going directly into the markets and driving the stock markets higher. And second, and most important is the rollout of multiple vaccines. We have almost four vaccines now, which is, um, you know, moving at an accelerated uh, pace. And there's high probability that going forward, uh, we'll see uh, recovery stocks doing really well. The stocks that were hard hit during the pandemic, such as uh, hotel, aviation, these stocks are expected to do really well this year. Uh, because of the primary reason uh, that once you are vaccinated, we will feel much safer uh, to move out into the world and, you know, travel like other than what you did last year. People would be more willing uh, to take a flight this year than they were last year. Um, and then, like I said, uh, because interest rates have started going up this year, there's a good chance that banking and financial companies will do well. And um, yeah, so among among the equity sectors, these are the particular sectors that you can focus on. And in terms of markets, uh, emerging markets this year are expected to outperform uh, the US markets and even uh, Japanese markets are expected to do well this year. Primary reason, China is one country which, uh, you know, in fact, uh, had the, the first country to exit and from coronavirus and they've been doing exceptionally well so chinese stocks are expected to do well this year also uh, because the dollar is expected to remain weak going forward we'll we'll see many investors uh, you know look out for uh, markets other than the united states and um, yeah we have uh, china and japanese markets uh, indian markets are expected to do well uh, there are different ETFs that i've mentioned on this slide that uh, you can refer to for uh, investments into the emerging markets moving on to uh, bond investors this year the outlook doesn't seem very um, rosy for bond investors um, just to mention um, bond prices tend to move inversely to the interest rates uh, the idea and logic is a little difficult and complicated to explain right now we can do a separate session for that but uh, just to explain just to you know brief you whenever interest rates go up uh, you can expect bond prices to fall and when that happens this year we are expecting interest rates to go up so hence bond prices uh, are expected to fall and may not be a good investment for 2021 moving forward uh, like I already mentioned, the outlook for dollar uh, remains weak. Um, instead, other currencies, cyclical stock, uh, commodities such as um, uh, Australian, New Zealand and Canadian dollars are expected to do well. Uh, also, Chinese uh, currency, the Chinese Yuan is expected to do well uh, this year. And lastly, moving on to commodities. Um, so. Uh, Apart from gold and other commodities uh, look very um, steady and robust and resilient this year. So uh, firstly, we have industrial metals. Most of the industrial metals are expected to do well because the industrial demand is going high. And uh, likewise, because of that, we expect um, industrial metals such as copper, aluminum uh, and others to do well this year. On the other hand, we have uh, energy, commodities, agricultural, all others are expected to do well, again, because the dollar is going to remain weak. And because the dollar will remain weak, you can expect commodities uh, to do well because they are priced in dollars. So it becomes you'll have to spend less number of dollars to buy a particular commodity. So that makes uh, that increases the demand for uh, commodities. So on and all. Uh, yeah, this year, barring gold, uh, other uh, other commodities uh, look uh, robust. So if I have to sum it up, equities and um, uh, commodities are a good investments this year. And you can uh, avoid uh, gold and uh, bonds for 2021. Now, uh, I'll, I'll just hand over to Varisha to guide you uh, through the other investment themes that are likely to dominate going forward. I shall, we can take over. Thank you, Deepa. Thank you, Deepa. Just on a side note, uh, if any of you have any questions, do write it in our chat box and we will address it towards the end of the seminar. 
Okay, so investment themes for the decade. Now, of course, Deepa covered very informatively well uh, about the investment themes for 2021, but what's the investment themes for the following decade? So now we all know about the second wave of digitalization, so data and artificial intelligence proliferating and disrupting all kinds of industries. We've been hearing this and seeing this from time and again, how it's um, doing a lot of disruption and in a good way. And one area that has been affected um, is substantial and which has substantial growth potential is life sciences. So biotechnology and anything related within that tech and bio space, uh, those have been doing extremely well. Um, and like gene and cell therapy has also been on an increase, especially now uh, more than ever, we've seen an increase in demand for these biotechnology. Uh, companies and just that industry as a whole. Even another thing that Deepa covered previously is uh, how Chinese assets are rising to core asset status. So, you know, since the economy is becoming stronger and is, uh, uh, you know, has bounced back so well from COVID, uh, it's becoming one of the largest um, economies. And it's, you know, how now we keep track of the U.S. economy and what um, the US markets do, but sooner or later we'll have to start keeping track of the Chinese economy and um, you know just have an exposure towards the Chinese market. And that's for the decade, basically. And of course, we cannot dismiss the whole energy transition, how um, electricity, clean tech, um, green energy, all of these things, I'm sure you've all heard of this on social media, but it's not just common on social media about sustainability and stuff. It's also common in the markets and it's become more and more popular and it's expected to get more and more popular as the years go by. Um, now, just covering briefly the hot sectors for the decade. So we are all aware of electric vehicles and how they're becoming more popular um, every other year. And in fact, uh, ARC, which is the company I mentioned of Cathy Wood previously, her company actually forecasted that uh, electric vehicle sales should increase about 20 fold. So from 2.2 million in 2020 to about 40 million units in 2025, which is a massive jump for something less than five years. Uh, it's pretty um, optimistic for electric vehicles. So we see that movement happening and we see more and more companies uh, incorporating electrical vehicles. So even companies that use uh, fuel gas um, gas vehicles, they have also been coming up with hybrid electric vehicles. And it's just slowly we can see this transition from uh, our fuel use car towards electric cars as a more green and um, sustainable way of living. And uh, another a sector that is interesting is renewable energy, which also comes under this whole sustainability green space, which uh, has also been expected to account for 22% of electricity generation by 2030, which is um, within the decade itself. It's a big increase from the 7 to 8% share it now represents. Um, so that's quite a large jump. We can see that this movement is um, uh, go going to happen perhaps over the years. Uh, another sector to look at is the big pharma and biotech. Of course, we know that big pharma biotech is something we've all been after this year more than ever, uh, especially after COVID hit. Everyone's been more focused within the space. And Morningstar also believes that there's going to be big advances in the science cell therapy so, and gene therapy as well. And a lot more like the pharmaceutical biotechnology world is huge and it's just growing as we speak. It's uh, just getting more and more popular and it's definitely the future. Uh, we definitely see it be more on a rise as the years go by. And last but not least, 3D printing, which has recently really become more popular and more insightful amongst people. So ARC, again, by Kathy Wood believes that 3D printing will revolutionize manufacturing um, and growing at an annual rate of about 60% from $12 billion last year to about $120 billion in 2025. So these are super optimistic numbers for literally less than a decade or within the decade. And it's something to just look out for because uh, we believe that it's 
it's on a horizon. It's definitely going to grow. Um, now, I'm sure everyone's heard about cryptocurrencies and the craze about cryptocurrencies that's been happening lately in the markets. Uh, you must be knowing someone who invests in cryptos or you myself, you yourself, sorry, would be interested in cryptos. So what's important is to know that there's not just one type of cryptocurrency um, because everyone's popularly known about Bitcoin. Uh, there are other types of cryptocurrencies to name a few, Ethereum, NEO, Stellar Lumens and Litecoin. Uh, these are just a few. There are more, especially on our platform. We do provide more um, cryptocurrencies. And um, despite Bitcoin being the most popular ones, these also are uh, quite commonly traded. And it's good to keep an eye on those as well. Um, this is just a two year sort of uh, depiction of how Bitcoin has grown over the years and how it's seen a sharp incline and we all are aware of that. I'm, uh, you know, the JP Morgan as well, they sort of predicted and uh, the analysts gave her an expectation that Bitcoin would perhaps even reach $146,000 in the long run. Um, they haven't given a time frame as such, but in the long run, which has really uh, made Bitcoin rally over, over time. And not just uh, the ratings, but even companies such as uh, Square and MicroStrategy have uh, not failed to incorporate uh, Bitcoin in their balance sheet. So we're seeing this movement like MicroStrategy, for example, it's a cloud computing uh, company, software company, and they themselves have had cash reserves in Bitcoin, which is uh, quite different because no one else has really done this but now we're seeing companies slowly do this even uh if you're tracking the news you must have noticed tesla also um bought some bitcoin lately and it's just uh we're just seeing this increase in um interest by top public companies to hold bitcoin within their balance sheet and within their um company which also might just be the next thing where other companies start to incorporate this and eventually the value push the value of Bitcoin higher than it already is. Um, as of today, it's about uh, near $53,000. So uh, of course it keeps uh, fluctuating, but uh, we're, we're just hoping for a better and uh, more upward movement for Bitcoin. Um, another thing I would like to mention is that when you construct your portfolio, when you actually, when it comes to actually investing within cryptocurrencies, what's important to know is your risk appetite, because this, of course, is another type of asset class. Cryptocurrencies itself is one type of asset class. So you need to realize what your risk appetite is. So if you're a risk averse trader, for example, you would probably hold a smaller percentage of um, cryptos in your portfolio. However, if you were to be a risk neutral or a risk taker, um, then of course you could hold a larger percentage. I believe personally it's, it's a good thing to hold, even if it's a small percentage, just so that it can be something you hold for the long term and um, watch it grow eventually. So um, that's all for our session for today. Sorry, Deepa, it's mute. I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a few questions out here uh, that we can see. Um, uh, Kusum uh, had asked about uh, REITs. Is it for a fixed timeline? Uh, no, the answer is it's not for a fixed timeline. You, In fact, uh, it can be uh, even traded as a stock. You can just buy uh, a REIT uh, company stock, like for example, we have the SPG group. Uh, so you can just invest in that particular asset and um, in that stock and you can exit whenever uh, you know, you've made a sizable uh, decent returns uh, according to your expectations. So uh, REITs uh, do not have a fixed timeline. Of course, ETFs, uh, if you invest in ETFs uh, directly, then um, they have certain uh, a window period. Some are closed ended, some are open ended. If they're closed ended, uh, uh, your investments, uh, you know, uh, will will have to will not they will not allow uh, other investors. But if they're open ended, you can invest whenever and exit whenever. So uh, that is uh, not going to be an issue with regards to uh, rates. Um, 
also we had another uh, question from kusum itself uh, regarding cryptos um yeah you can carry on varisha sure uh so kusum asked uh, do you advise which cryptocurrencies are good so like i mentioned on this slide previously these are the types of uh, cryptocurrencies they're all pretty interesting you could obviously definitely go for bitcoin but um it's just that you want to try and find the next bitcoin so something like ethereum or stellar lumens looks like it's um bound to you know go up further so you want to try and catch a uh, cryptocurrency which is actually on the verge of growing further uh bitcoin is of course um everyone's favorite but yes there are these other um ones which are also commonly traded it's just not spoken of as much but they are quite popular as well so i hope that answers your question yeah Mm. yeah but like parisha mentioned uh crypto assets are uh, highly risky assets so uh whatever you invest in cryptos you need to be like make sure uh you know that is one that is one investment that you can even let go of uh, let go of so just uh, be sure you're investing only that proportion of your investments that you do not uh, you know require in the future so uh, right uh, what is the percentage recommended for crypto again that depends on your risk profile uh, overall we can we can do a one on one session uh, you know you can uh, discuss with your uh, with the consultants as to what are your uh, you know life goals or what uh, what is the kind of investments or funds that you'll require in the future and accordingly we can chart out a a, a plan as to what percentage can go into cryptos so it will the answer will always vary from person to person um mm-hmm. there is no direct answer for that mm-hmm. yeah it really depends on your risk appetite and how much you know um uh, risk you're willing to take of course if you're a risk averse trader we uh, we'd recommend a smaller percentage but um yes like deepa said we can always discuss this one on one so please feel free to get in touch with us and uh we can always discuss any further investment related queries or strategies anything that you're interested in yeah we even have uh you know multiple stock portfolios that we've uh, drafted recently as to what would be good investments going forward this year um uh, so uh for anyone who's interested we can do a separate session on uh good stock investment opportunities uh in 2021 we have a chinese portfolio a long term us portfolio uh so likewise whatever uh, stock markets have corrected uh many investors are looking at this opportunity to enter uh, the markets so uh if you have any doubts any queries uh, you can write to us uh, or you know um even probably contact us we can do another session or a one 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 on one session uh, whatever uh, is comfortable mm-hmm. right so uh, if there are any more questions uh, we are happy to answer we'll just wait for a minute or two uh, if not we'll uh, end the session okay mm-hmm. i'd also like to add that a lot of ladies believe that trading is a full-time job but we do have a lot of strategies that we can work around and uh you know have you manage your time so it's not something you cannot do it's definitely something you can do and something we'd encourage uh the females especially for women's day to actually consider so yeah yeah like if you believe in brands uh, for example if you believe in lvmh if you believe in an apple if you believe electric vehicles are going to be the future then why not uh, it's better we invest mm-hmm. uh, our funds in these companies uh, for example a stock like tesla has rallied by almost 15000% last year uh, in the last 5 years so um okay uh what's the minimum ticket size at a uh, century uh, uh, i think uh, that is something you can uh, you know contact with uh, the relationship manager and he'll be able to answer those queries but uh, as far as i believe it's uh, somewhere close to um, $10000 but uh, we can have uh, you know a separate session with uh, fix you up with a relationship manager who can answer all your uh, queries diksha all right then um 
I believe, uh, okay. Yes, we definitely feel uh, Tesla is uh, overpriced. Kusum. Kusum has asked a question. Do you think Tesla is overpriced? Uh, yes, Tesla is uh, overpriced. Uh, and uh, these returns that I'm talking 15,000% uh, is after the price have fallen from the levels of 900 and right now they're near about 600. So uh, Tesla is uh, overpriced, but um, when you have uh, you know a lot of liquidity in the market and a lot of uh, people chasing a particular stock then sometimes fundamentals don't hold true uh, so yes tesla is uh, overpriced and that is why the best investment approach that we recommend uh, is uh, systematic investment planning so uh, never invest uh, all your funds at one at one go into the stock markets it's always uh, best to uh, you know plan your investments and have a fixed proportion invested every month or uh, every quarter however uh, you are comfortable but uh, it's always best to uh, average out and uh, yeah apart from tesla we have many other uh, electric vehicle stocks uh, out there uh, now which in fact now uh, have corrected and uh, can be a decent entry point uh, going forward mm -hmm. All right. So um, thank you, everyone. It was, uh, thank you, everyone. It was lovely talking to you all. Uh, I hope thank we were able to clarify. I, I really hope uh, this session was useful and we were able to clarify some of your investment related doubts and queries. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, Kusum. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Lo lovely talking to all you ladies and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon again in the next session. Thank you so All much, right. ladies. See you. Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye.